Hey everyone and welcome back. Ready for another deep dive? Ever feel like you're trying to understand people without the instruction manual? Like what's really going on in their heads? It's like we think we're pretty good at reading people, you know, <laughs> but there's always so much more beneath the surface. Totally. And we've got this book that claims to be a crash course in exactly that decoding the people around us. It's fascinating. We often treat understanding people as this purely logical thing, but... It's way more complex than that, right? Exactly. So where do we even begin? <laughs> well, the book starts with this idea of motivation. It's like a behavioral crystal ball. Okay, so if we can figure out what drives someone... We can better understand their actions. It's not about mind reading, of course. More like making educated guesses. Exactly. And to help us make those guesses, the book dives into some pretty fascinating psychological models. Okay, I'm intrigued. Hit me with it. What's the first one? Well, have you ever heard of the shadow? Hmm. Rings a bell, but refresh <laughs> my memory. <laughs> the, the Jungian idea, right? We all have this hidden side to ourselves, the part of us where we bury all the feelings and desires that we think are unacceptable. Oh, right. It's like that friend who's always the life of the party, super outgoing. But deep down, maybe their shadow side is terrified of being alone, of not being liked. So they overcompensate by constantly seeking external validation. Exactly. And the book argues that even though the shadow self is hidden, it still influences our choices. Even if we're totally unaware of it. Exactly. Like, think about the classic example of the straight-A student who suddenly goes wild in college. Right. Like they were so focused on achievement, on pleasing everyone, that they just snapped. They're finally expressing that hidden rebellious side. It's like their shadow self is finally breaking free. And then the book introduces another psychological concept, the inner child. Okay, so this one I've heard of. It's basically the idea that our childhood experiences stick with us. Right, and they shape how we react to things, even as adults. Sometimes we react to situations not from our rational adult selves, but from that more vulnerable, emotionally raw place uh -huh. of our inner child. Exactly. Oh my gosh, this is so true. Ever get in an argument with someone and they just completely overreact to something small? It can be really frustrating. But if you think about it, like maybe they're reacting from their wounded inner child, it kind of makes more sense. Right. It's not about excusing bad behavior. But it can help us be more compassionate. Instead of judging someone's seemingly irrational behavior, we can try to understand where it's coming from. And that understanding can be a game changer in our relationships. For sure. So we've got our shadow selves, our inner children. What other psychological baggage are we working with here? Well, from the subconscious, we go to something a bit more straightforward. The pleasure-pain principle. Oh, this one I get. We're hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. It's pretty basic. Right. And the book argues that this principle applies to everything. From what we choose for lunch. To the biggest life decisions we make. Okay, so like, why choose a salad when there's a giant plate of nachos calling your name? Sometimes that desire for immediate pleasure is just too strong to resist, even if it means we might regret it later. It's like our brains are wired for instant gratification. Exactly. You know, the book actually gives this fascinating example of chapulins, which are grasshoppers that are a popular snack in some cultures. Oh, hold on. Love a good deep dive, but I'm drawing the line in eating bugs. That's exactly the point. Just the thought of eating grasshoppers might make some people squeamish, even if they've never tried them. It's our perception of what will be painful or disgusting that drives our actions. Even if it's based on, like, assumptions or cultural conditioning. Precisely. It's like how some people freak out about public speaking. Mm -hmm. Rationally, they know it's not dangerous. But that fear response is so powerful, it overrides logic. So interesting. Okay, so we've got these unconscious drives, these echoes from our past. Yeah. And then there's that classic Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Ah, yes, the famous pyramid. Basic needs at the bottom, like food and shelter. And as we meet those needs, we move up to things like belonging, self-esteem. All the way to self-actualization at the top. It's like leveling up in a video game. But instead of points, we're collecting experiences and fulfilling needs to reach our full potential. Love that analogy. And the book uses a great example to illustrate this. They talk about a counselor at a women's shelter. Okay, I'm listening. And how understanding Maslow's hierarchy helps her support the residents. She recognizes that before she can address things like self-esteem or career goals, she needs to make sure their basic needs for safety and security are met. Because those needs are fundamental. They come first. Exactly. Right. We're not just trying to motivate people in a vacuum. We need to understand where they're at on their own personal journey. 
So we're not all starting from the same level on that pyramid. That makes sense. Okay, so far we've got these frameworks for what drives people. But what about when things get a little more, shall we say, complicated? You mean when our own minds get in the way? Exactly. Like, what about those times when we're not even honest with ourselves about our true motivations? Ah, uh, you're talking about defense mechanisms. Right. Like, when we're trying to protect our egos, even if it means distorting reality a bit. That's where things get really interesting. Because our egos are masters of self-preservation. And they have all sorts of sneaky tactics to keep themselves safe. It's like our brains build this fortress around our fragile egos. And they've got all sorts of defense mechanisms to keep those walls strong. Okay, so give me some examples. What are some of these defense mechanisms? Well, denial is a classic. Oh, denial is huge E. It's like, picture that friend who refuses to believe their partner is cheating on them even when they've got all the evidence. Or someone loses their job and insists it's no big deal that they were going to quit anyway. Classic rationalization. It's amazing how good we are at convincing ourselves of things, even if they're not true, just to avoid uncomfortable feelings. It's a way of protecting ourselves. And there are so many other fascinating defense mechanisms. For example, there's one called reaction formation, where we transform an unacceptable impulse into its opposite. Okay, so let's say someone has a crippling fear of heights. Right, and they overcompensate for that fear by becoming obsessed with something like, say, rock climbing. They're constantly talking about how exhilarating it is to conquer their fears, but really, they're just trying to convince themselves. Exactly. They're projecting this image of themselves as fearless and adventurous when deep down. They're terrified. Wow. Okay, so to recap what we've learned so far, understanding people's motivations, is like peeling back the layers of an onion. It's a complex puzzle. You've got these unconscious drives, past experiences, and even our own ego's defenses all playing a role. It's amazing how much our own minds can complicate things. Tell me about it. But this is just the beginning, right? We've got to go deeper. Oh, absolutely. Because in the next part of our deep dive, we're going full-on detective mode. We're diving into the world of micro-expressions. You know, those tiny facial movements that betray our true feelings, even when we're trying to hide them. We'll also uncover how our bodies, our stuff, and even our online lives reveal more about us than we might realize. So stick around. It's about to get really good. All right, decoders, welcome back. So last time, things got kind of deep, right? We were exploring all those hidden motivations, those unconscious forces that shape our actions. Our shadow selves. Those echoes of our inner child. And of course, all those defense mechanisms our brains use to protect us from, well, ourselves. It's a lot to process. It really is. But the good news is we're moving from the internal world to the external today. We're talking about how all that hidden stuff actually shows up in our faces, our bodies, even our online lives. We're basically learning to decode a whole new language, the language of nonverbal communication. I love it. It's like we're going full on Sherlock Holmes here. Exactly. And this book is our handy dandy guide to all those subtle cues and tells. So where do we start? What's the first thing we should be paying attention to? Well, the book dives deep into micro expressions. You know, those super fast facial movements that can reveal hidden emotions in a flash. OK, so it's not just about catching someone rolling their eyes when they say, yeah, everything's fine. There's much more to it than that. We're talking about those subtle twitches and movements that most people don't even consciously register. So, like, what kind of things should we be looking for? Give me some examples. Well, each basic emotion, like happiness, sadness, anger, fear, they all have their own telltale micro-expression. Wait, really? So you're telling me there's a specific way our faces move when we're trying to hide sadness? Exactly. It's all about those tiny movements of the eyebrows, eyelids, and mouth. They happen unconsciously, so it's hard to fake them. So it's like a fake smile might reach the lips, but not the eyes. Precisely. It's that disconnect between what someone is saying verbally and what their face is really telling you. Okay, I'm starting to see how this works. But it seems like it would be easy to overanalyze things. Right. That's why context is key. We need to look at the whole picture, not just focus on one isolated expression. It's like putting together a puzzle, right? We need more than one piece to see the full image. Exactly. So along with micro expressions, the book also talks about tells, those little body language cues that can betray our true feelings. Oh, OK. So. Give me some examples of tells. What kind of things should we be looking for? Well, it could be anything from fidgeting to excessive blinking, touching the face or neck, avoiding eye contact. So someone who claims to be totally relaxed about a situation but 
can't seem to sit still. Exactly. Or maybe they're constantly adjusting their hair or clothes. Those little gestures can speak volumes. They really can. But again, context is everything. One gesture on its own doesn't necessarily mean anything. We need to look for clusters of behavior, right? Multiple cues that all point in the same direction. You got it. It's about putting all those puzzle pieces together to get a more accurate read on the situation. So we're like detectives, gathering clues from someone's words, their tone of voice, their facial expressions, their body language. It's about fine-tuning our observation skills. And like any skill, it takes practice. Right. We're not going to become human lie detectors overnight. But even just being aware of these nonverbal cues can make a big difference in how we understand and interact with people. So it's about being more present, more observant in our everyday interactions. I can get behind that. Okay, so we're getting better at reading faces and bodies. But this book doesn't stop there, does it? Not even close. It also delves into the world of personality frameworks, things like the big five personality traits. Oh, right. I've heard of those openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and what was the last one? Neuroticism. Basically, it gives us a framework for understanding different tendencies. Right. So, like, someone high in openness might be more adventurous and curious. While someone high in conscientiousness might be more organized and detail-oriented. Exactly. And while these tests aren't foolproof, they can be a helpful starting point for understanding ourselves and others. They give us a common language to talk about personality and behavior. I like it. It's all about finding those patterns. So what other personality frameworks does the book mention? Well, it gets into some less mainstream models, like Jungian archetypes. Ooh, Jungian archetypes. Now we're getting deep. Okay, break it down for me. What are those exactly? Well, Jung believed that these universal recurring patterns of behavior and imagery show up across cultures and throughout history. Things like the hero, the rebel, the creator. Okay, so they're like these universal characters that represent different aspects of the human experience. Exactly. And these archetypes can offer us insights into our own motivations, our strengths, our shadows. I like it. It's like we all have a little bit of each archetype within us. Exactly. So we've got our shadow selves, our inner children, our Jungian archetypes. It's like we're building this whole psychological profile of ourselves and the people around us. And the more pieces of the puzzle we have, the better we can understand the bigger picture. I'm into it. Okay, so what else? What other tools does this book give us? Well, it also talks about Kirsi temperaments, which you can think of as a more in-depth look at personality types. Okay, so yeah. this is kind of like Myers-Briggs, right? Yeah. The personality test everyone's always talking about. They're definitely related. Kirsi temperaments actually build on the Myers-Briggs framework. But instead of 16 personality types, it categorizes people into four main temperament groups, guardians, artisans, idealists, and rationals. Okay, so let me take a stab at this. Guardians are all about structure and rules. Right. Artisans are the free-spirited creative types. Exactly. Idealists are the big-hearted dreamers and rationals. Right. They're the logic-driven thinkers of the bunch. You nailed it. This is fascinating. Yeah. But it also feels a little theoretical, like how do we actually apply all this in real life? Well, the book argues that it's not about making snack judgments, but rather looking for those consistent patterns in people's behavior. So paying attention to how they show up in different situations with different people. Exactly. It's about becoming more attuned to those subtle cues, those patterns that reveal who someone really is. Okay, so this is where things get a little sneaky. Yeah. Right? It's like snooping with consent. In a way, yes. The book dedicates a whole section to what our belongings can reveal about us. Okay, now we're talking. This is the stuff I live for. You mean to tell me you can learn something about someone by checking out their bookshelf? Absolutely. Think about it. Our environments are like extensions of ourselves. They reflect our values, our priorities, even our aspirations. So someone with a meticulously organized desk is signaling they're all about order and control? Maybe. While someone with a more chaotic creative space might thrive on spontaneity and inspiration. So interesting. What about those people who have completely bare apartments? What does that say about them? Well, it could mean a lot of things, right? Maybe they're minimalist, or maybe they're just starting out, or maybe they're always on the go. Okay, so context is still key. Got yeah. it. But this idea that our belongings can offer clues into who we are, that's fascinating. It really is. And it's not just about our physical possessions. The book also delves into the world of social media. Oh, yes. Social media. Everyone's curating their online image these days. Mm -hmm. But can we really glean any real insights from that? Well, the book highlights research that suggests our online presence can be surprisingly revealing, especially when it comes to positive personality traits. Really? 
So all those vacation photos and perfectly filtered selfies might actually tell us something about someone's true personality. It's definitely a possibility, but again, it's all about looking for patterns, not taking any single post or picture as the whole story. It's like we're detectives piecing together a profile based on someone's belongings, their online activity, their body language, their micro expressions. This is mind blowing. It's about layering those observations to get a more complete picture. And all this information, it's not about judging people, right? It's about... It's about understanding, fostering empathy, improving communication. Exactly. It's about becoming better communicators and more compassionate human beings. Because at the end of the day, we're all just trying to navigate this complex world together. And we've all got our own unique set of motivations, fears, and desires driving us. All right, Master Decoders, welcome back. We are cruising toward the end of our deep dive here. Can you believe how much we've covered already? Seriously. We've been neck deep in those hidden motivations, those sneaky shadow selves. Those echoes of our inner child. All those defense mechanisms our brains cook up. It's like we've been on this whirlwind tour of the human psyche. It's a lot, but now it's time to bring it all home. We've got one final piece of the puzzle to uncover. The power of asking the right questions. Yes, this book really emphasizes this, right? And we're not talking about your average small talk. No, no, no. We're talking about those insightful questions, those conversation ninjas that really get people to open up. The ones that slip past those surface level responses and really get to the heart of who someone is. Precisely. It's about getting past those canned answers. And the book gives some really great examples of those insightful questions, like instead of asking, what are your values? Which, let's be honest, can feel kind of forced. They suggest asking, what would you rescue from a burning house? Ooh, now that is a question. It forces you to think on your feet to make those split-second decisions about what's truly important. It's like a real-life version of those desert island scenarios. If you could only say one thing, what would it be? It really makes you think because it goes way beyond material possessions. It gets at those deeper values and priorities. Exactly. The book also suggests asking things like, what kind of prize would you work hardest for? Or what punishment would you work hardest to avoid? Those are good. It's like a sneak peek into their internal reward system. Their hopes, their fears, their motivations, it's all there. Okay, this is reminding me of another insightful question from uh. the book. It talks about spending habits. But instead of just asking, what do you spend money on? Which can feel a bit intrusive. Right. They suggest asking, where do you love to splurge? And where do you absolutely refuse to skimp? Much better. Those questions tell you so much about a person. Their priorities, their indulgences, their non-negotiables. Exactly. Like, are you the type who will drop a fortune on a fancy meal, yeah. but hates to spend money on clothes? Or maybe you're all about those travel experiences, but live a pretty minimalist lifestyle otherwise. So fascinating. But asking the right questions, that's only half the equation, right? You've got to be an active listener. And I'm not just talking about waiting for your turn to speak. Right. It's about really paying attention. To their tone of voice their body language. Those micro expressions. Exactly. It's about reading between the lines, picking up on all those nonverbal cues. And don't forget about context. Someone's response might be different depending on their mood that day, their relationship with you, even the environment you're in. So many factors at play. It's like being a detective. You've got to consider all the angles. Exactly. It's all connected. Well, here we are. We've reached the end of our deep dive. We've explored the hidden world of motivation from those sneaky shadow selves to the power of asking the right questions. We've learned to read micro expressions, decipher body language, and even glean insights from someone's stuff. It's like we've been handed this incredible toolkit for decoding people, their motivations, their behaviors, their deepest desires. It's powerful stuff. It really is. Yeah. But as we've discussed throughout this deep dive, this knowledge isn't about manipulation or trying to control people. It's about building genuine connections. It's about fostering understanding, empathy, and compassion, both for ourselves and for others. Because at the end of the day, we're all just trying to navigate this crazy, beautiful, messy thing called life. And hopefully, with a little more awareness, a little more understanding, we can all make that journey a little bit easier for each other. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, everyone.